an honor to be in my home state. Um, I forget that it's my home state because um, my identity is so closely tied in with Pittsburgh. Um, but it's wonderful to be recognized here, here in Pennsylvania. And the hospitality of the Pennsylvania Center for the book uh, was fabulous before I even got here, much less now that I'm here. So thank you, all of you. Uh, Carolyn was just wonderful, and Stephen was wonderful, and Bill's generous introduction. The design of the poster is just, just fabulous. So it's just really terrific. To be on Penn State's campus, I would mention to Bill on the way over here, the last time I was here was, I think in 1972, in a, in a dormitory, and then a fraternity party. Um, so this is different. Um, I didn't know there were academic buildings here. And it's really nice to share a stage with, with Eleanor Wilner, too, who I can tell you everyone at Warren Wilson when I was there. Um, felt that she was beatific, and she is, so, so it's really good to be here. I'll start by reading the, the poem that was chosen for the poster. It's called Knocked, um, and it's really about, it's, it's, it's a true story. It's about my dad, who was a, a steel worker at Edgar Thompson Steelworks in Braddock, PA, which was the very first steel mill that Andrew Carnegie opened in the United States. And the story tells itself, but I, I really, my, my sister and I, my sister's in the audience, Marie Reese, and my great nephew, Joshua Reese, is here too, so I'm really glad. This is, so this is about his great-grandfather. My sister and I were more or less protected or kept oblivious about really what our dad did for a living. Um, we knew he was a steel worker. I had no idea really what that was. Um, and he never talked about it. And he was truly, I mean, I don't think I'm over-sentimentalizing him when I say he was, he was just about the most wonderful father, especially a boy like me could have had. This is called Knocked. I was 17 before I saw Edgar Thompson, the steel mill where my father had worked since he was 17. And only then, because I needed his car for the senior after prom picnic, the theme was color my world. Sleepless, having danced all night, a furnace of cheap champagne and still in my tuxedo, I dropped him off at 7 a.m. in Braddock, named for a revolutionary war general, three bars in every block, street lights turned on in the afternoon so the school kids could see their ways home through the ore dust. The mill was blue and corrugated, rising in shaft after shaft of smoke that sawtoothed into gray sky. I never saw its top. The men in the boom crane cabs wore hard hats and drank coffee. They had it knocked, my father said, but not him. He had to climb the backs of those monsters. When I was little and insisted I wanted to be like him and work in the mill, he'd snap, no you're not, you're going to college. In a few months, I really would be going to college. Working in a steel mill was the last thing I wanted to do. My father eased out of the car, handed me a 20, told me to be careful, pinned on his millwright's badge, and filed into the smoke with the others. I turned up the radio, dropped the engine into low for torque, and floored it. Sure that in one night, I had had more fun, more love, more everything than he had had in his life. And I wanted to get back to it as fast as I could. I did something I never do, ever. I marked the pages from the poems I would read from, and I still can't find them. <laughs> this is called The Electrifying Vernacular of Escape. It's for my sister Marie, who's here. My sister was um, just a committed reader when, when we were kids. She just read and read and read and read and read all the time. And I, I just remember always reading. And, and my mother was just undone by the fact that my sister was reading all the time. It just harped all the time at her that all you do is read, all you do is read. And, and, um, 
this, this kind of um, commemorates that antipathy. As a girl, Marie read so much, my mother branded her lazy, a withering accusation in our house of ceaseless toil. In her way, mother was a Calvinist. She believed in mortifying the flesh, denaturing will. Work took your mind off things. It's nothing, she liked to say of our discomfort. Just thank God you have arms and legs. <laughs> each page Marie turned, each flight of make-believe described a stray footprint on the carpet, a dirty saucer on the sideboard, the newspaper left over long on the ottoman. Words possessed a focused untidiness, immodest, black as Negroes, violating the pristine doily of the page. My sister, pale, bespectacled, disarrayed across her bed, a book like an infant splayed in her arm, terrified my mother, as if in her incessant reading she had authored mother against her will, cursed an unforgivable lash to keeping a house where words like mice burst from the woodwork, tumbled among the silver, dropping behind them the punctuation of regret, the bitter trope of memory. Adhering to vows of silence and obedience, Marie said nothing. She would close her book, clip its place with the holy card of the Virgin, pressed dutifully through the house like a captive forced to char, scouring porcelain, mopping linoleum, redding soiled linen from the beds, whatever homage the raised octaves of my mother required. Yet that book like a forbidden lover whispered from its hiding place, luring her back to it with promises of seduction and danger, the electrifying vernacular of escape. It was just a matter of time before she slipped into its pages and disappeared 